I mean, you said it earlier on as well, you know, you've got some managers whose teams will go, right, how are we going to work? Because those will be the teams that have had the managers in the organisation beforehand who were brilliant, who knew how to work with their teams, who knew how to get the best out of each of their individuals, who knew how to support everybody to be able to deliver their best. And they will have had their ups and downs throughout this period like everyone else, but they will all have survived and be ready to come out and, and go again. The poor managers and the ones whose teams weren't engaged, didn't have all of that, you know, they will be sitting there looking at all the things that are going to get in their way, all the things that are going to be a problem. You know, we, where we live, I wouldn't want to go into Oxford on the bus every day. You know, so again, this, you know, but you can say, okay, well, come in on the bus, but come in at 10 o'clock, you know, do two hours in the morning and then get the bus and then, you know, and be on a bus that isn't rammed with people and then stay a bit later or go home, but, you know, just do five hours in the office and pick up some other hours, some other, you know, or it's about being creative with the way people work, you know, just, just be creative. Let's look at when, like you said, when, when do I work best? When do I do my best work? So if I know when that is, I can fit around that. But I think there are organisations that it's like moving the Titanic. But then the Titanic moved pretty bloody quickly when it had to. So it was going in that direction. Yeah, like <laughs> last March, you know, I mean, you know, I've read somewhere or somebody's told me or I've heard that we basically moved the dial forward 30 years in the whole debate around remote working and working from home and everything. And at the end of the day, all you needed was a computer and blah, blah, blah. Now, I do feel for people who are obviously in a bed sit or have a huge family at home whatever it is I mean there's all sorts of circumstances and it, it yeah. suits some people really well and people that have to sit in their beds while they're working I mean there's a whole host of yeah. circumstances but then perhaps it's back again I suppose in a way is it going to be the psychological contract or the employment contract that that you're going to have to revisit as well because if people want to be able to work from home then how does your, you know, we've got workplace health and safety. So how do you translate that into the home? Are you still responsible for your employees if they're sitting on their bed at home doing their full day's work? So I think there is a whole host of, yeah. of things that need to be worked out. And some of them will have to be contractual, I would imagine, just because it's easier but it's very hard to, you can't put perceptions <laughs> of how to behave into a, an employment contract. No, and I, you know, I do, I think there's a whole rake of health and safety claims going to come out of the woodwork in the next 6, 12, 18 months because those poor people that have been sat on their beds with the laptop on the knees, fundamentally, my understanding is that it's the employer's responsibility. If somebody's working from home, it's still the employer's responsibility to get them to do a risk assessment to identify if what those issues might be. And I suspect that's probably been swept under because I know when I first started working from home many, many years ago, I had to do a risk assessment and take that back in to, to say to my employer, this was like 10 years ago, that, you know, you're not responsible. I've done a risk assessment, therefore you're not responsible if I get any, um, you know, orthopedic issues because I've sat on a kitchen chair as opposed to my nice office chair in the other room. But will it be an act of God? <laughs> COVID. Yeah. I'm sure that's exactly what their lawyers would be arguing. <laughs> I mean, the insurance companies are not going to be paying out for that, I would imagine. Oh, no. But I do, for me, every single person who has the responsibility for the workload of other people, whether it be, you know, in whatever, in whatever 
shape or guise that comes in, you have an ethical and a moral obligation to have a conversation with that person if you've not already started the whole thing you know now to find out how are you feeling what is worrying you what are your concerns about coming back what are the logistics for your family now how can we support you to create a working environment that works for both of us in exactly the same way that happened to me when I came back from maternity leave. I still fundamentally had a job I had to go to four days a week. I had to work out that stuff. And that was you know, slightly different because it's a slightly different psychological impact than, than a global pandemic. And there may well be people that just when it comes down to it, can't do it, can't face it, can't the thought of going back to work. And if as an employer, that cannot work and you have tried everything to make that work then there may be some conversations that you have to have which is you know we've done everything this is the best option we can do and if that isn't going to be enough then that's you can't fulfill the, the obligations of your role but you've got to do absolutely everything you've got to look at every single possible viable solution that there is but you've both got to be happy with it because if you agree to something for that person that as a team manager or as an employer that you are not happy about for whatever reason that's going to be your negative psychological contract from the beginning because you're sitting there resenting the fact that this is happening so you are going to be a hideous boss not mm -hmm. deliberately necessarily but you are eventually going to get so with it